Welcome back to our weekly series called Survive to Thrive, Live the Story You Create. What this is, if this is your first time tuning in, is a series of conversations where we explore the connection between one's personal narrative and the topics of grief, appreciation, gratitude, resilience, and many other topics. So if you're interested in seeing any of the previous episodes or any of the previous conversations, please visit either our YouTube or find any of them on iTunes by simply searching Overcoming Odds, and you'll be able to find them as podcasts that we've had previously. But before we get into today's theme and today's episode, just wanted to make a few quick announcements. And the first one being, actually first is welcome everyone on the show, including Jessica Dugas, who has jo joined us here. <laughs> but the first announcement that I wanted to make is this, and that is if our show or if our work has had any form of impact in your life, Please consider supporting our cause by either making a contribution through our website at overcomingodds.today or leaving us a review on Facebook, iTunes, LinkedIn, wherever you can find Overcoming Odds. That would help us tremendously in getting these messages out there even more. The next announcement that I wanted to make is in regard to an event that Overcoming Odds will be featured as a part of, and that is at the bottom, you're able to see here a musical evening of giving with a mutual friend of ours, Jessica Dugas, who has joined us here on the show as well, who has a podcast of her own called The Breakthrough Show. And this is an event that we'll be hosting where we will <clears throat> be featured as one of two nonprofits that will be benefiting from this particular experience. So if you feel like this is something that you would like to support us in, please go ahead and click the link below and we'll make sure to include it in the comments section as well. And with that said, I wanted to introduce the two co-hosts of this particular weekly, weekly series. First, first one is, his name is Casey Berman, and the other one is Scott Mason. And the topic of today's conversation that I wanted to explore with each and every single one of you revolves around this question of meaning. And in particular, are you aware of the meaning the events have in your life? And if so, what is it? And with that said, let's please welcome them onto the show. Berman and Scott Mason. Welcome back. It is good to be here. And it is good to see Jessica and anyone else who's watching. Yes, I'm I'm always always delighted to see people like Jessica and Melody and, and Kenny and everyone else that chooses to tune in because 
you know, as I mentioned earlier, I think it's, yes, we might be the ones that are starting the conversation, but at the end of the day, it only goes so far. And, and unless we have other people's opinions and perspective, it, we kind of run into some walls or roadblocks. Well, are you saying that we start the conversation and those people finish it? <laughs> no, I, I, <laughs> no, I think I think what I'm trying to say is that they truly do add a tremendous amount to these these topics and make them um, even more lively than than they may appear to be. But <clears throat> I'm I'm really interested in having this particular conversation with the two of you and anyone else that chooses to tune in. And then there's this question you're able to see above, and that is, are you aware of the meaning of the events in your life? And I figure that the best way that maybe we can even start off this particular discussion is by exploring the following. And that is, how do you actually determine which of your events have meaning and which of your events don't? And, and how long do some of those events have meaning for? And do you find that over time, some of the meaning changes just due to other experiences that add on to that journey? So as the two of you know, easy questions, loaded questions, uh, whichever one of you would like to start off first, please do so. Scott, you... Uh... <laughs> yeah, first of all, I will say hi to someone else very special who I see in the comment section, Steve Gamlin. You're here. So Steve says, I took the lesson, or he basically says that he takes a lesson out of everything that happens, and I need to get out of the way of the caption here. So I, that is something that I used to go on instinct with. There were certain times when I would meet certain people or I would experience certain things and I would know in that instant that they had meaning. There was someone who I was asked many years ago, almost a decade ago, to meet for lunch to discuss this person being a potential client of mine. And we, after many reschedulings, agreed to meet in New York City's Chinatown, right in the down right in the heart of this very, very packed area. And it was at a subway stop that has four entrances, one for each corner of this very, very congested intersection. And I got out of the subway and he got out of the subway, but at two different stops. And despite the <laughs> fact that there were hundreds of people walking around this intersection, we looked across Caddy Corner or, or you know, diagonally across from each other and saw each other. A, we instantly knew who each other were without having even ever met before or even seen each other before. And we mm -hmm. ran across and immediately gave each other a hug. And we were best friends ever since, right? And for many years, we worked together. So that was something where seeing that person for the first time in a congested I had no way of knowing who he was, nor did he have any way of knowing who I was, but in a congested part of Chinatown in New York City and, and meeting for the first time, we felt such a powerful instant connection that I knew that there was going to be meaning. Was that person in my life forever? No. Was I in that person's life forever? No. But did we have a profound impact on each other? Yes. Other times it can be a little bit of a slow grow. There mm -hmm. have been times in which things that seem inconsequential and that I've forgotten about I later, it's almost as though I rediscover them through some sort of, I don't know, it's almost like an event occurring later triggers a memory of this other thing that would make what later happened to have consequence in my life meaning. Now, are there things that have no meaning at all? Steve Gamlin takes a pretty uh, radical uh, stake in the ground here, and I don't fault him for that. I take radical stakes of my own all the time. And that is that everything does. Does everything truly matter? Like when I look in my, in the mirror, I was, before the show started, my hair was all looking crazy. Right? Like when I look in the mirror and move a hair back in place, does I that have meaning? <laughs> right. Well, everyone will be checking their hair across the United States when they're watching and listening to this. Does that action really have meaning? I would tend to argue not. However, Maybe it does. Mm -hmm. Maybe by checking that hair, I managed to look good in the moment that someone was looking at me for an opportunity. 
and mm-hmm. decided, oh, he's well put together. So maybe I'll give him, among <clears throat> for other reasons, that opportunity. And the fact that I would have fiddled with my hair made a difference. Then there's also the issue of positive or negative meaning. Meaning is often interpreted and we assume in conversation as I take it, that meaning is related to some growth opportunity or something wonderful that happens to you or something that ultimately leads to a betterment in your life. But I was wondering, and sometimes do wonder about more cosmic meanings. I read an article recently about a boy, an African-American boy in the South who was accused of raping or otherwise behaving sexually inappropriately towards a white woman, which we know in the 60s and the 50s and 40s, times before that, people were accused of that all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was a way of terrorizing an entire population. And this poor boy, he was 12, and I believe he may have been developmentally disabled as well. There was no evidence really outside of her word and the prosecutor and all white jury um, convicted him and he was he was killed on the electric chair. And then it later came out that this whole thing never happened and that she had been assaulted, I believe, but it had been by white people. Mm-hmm. Now, was there meaning? I bet to his mom, I bet to any brothers and sisters he had, and I bet to him in the last moments there are pictures of him as he's sitting in the electric chair, clearly confused and frightened. Did this have meaning? What is the meaning as I'm about to be executed for something he knew in his heart he didn't do? Mm-hmm. Who knows? Well, why do you why do you think meaning? So there are a couple of things that come to mind. The first one is, I think, in, somewhat similar to Jessica's comment as well, and that is the question is, what weight are we going to put on the meaning itself? But the other thing that I got genuinely curious in is you were sharing your story, Scott, and that is, why do you think meaning is oftentimes associated with only the positive aspect of it? Because that's I, how it appears to me. And I don't know if Casey, you can relate to this as well, but I've noticed this sometimes, not sometimes, but in many different situations when I was looking for meaning or, or someone else was looking for meaning, it was, it was only looking at the positive elements of it and not necessarily the ones that could be perceived as negative. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Yeah, I will say that Probably because in the self-development space, the inspirational space, or the space of people that are engaging in conversations about improving either our lives or the lives of others, there is, I would be shocked if there's not a positivity bias or an optimism bias. Mm. Why else would we be involved in this? If we had a bias towards cynicism or pessimism, (laughs) pessimism or fatalism, we wouldn't be trying to make the world better. We would be basically throwing in the towel. Mm Mm-hmm. But that's just a guess. Mr. Berman. Yeah, so are you aware of the meaning of the events in your life? I am, to, to some. And for me, I look at it, if, if you we define meaning as value or significance or importance, we can also define meaning as a purpose, why we're even here, everyone's searching for the meaning of life. So I look at it two ways. And one is we can either look at events happening to us and having meaning to us Mm -hmm. or we can look at the way which we've talked about before that we give meaning to everything that happens to us and you can choose how you want i feel like the former that events happen to me is sort of like the blue pill in the matrix um we're either a victim or we're lucky in life and it just happens, it's out of my control. I'm gonna make the best of it. And that lets us have a narrative of I'm I'm Steph Curry and I'm great and I work hard and life is great and I'm so happy I'm here, you know, or I'm a victim and I have a narrative of, so you can look at it that way. And I, I look at it that way many times. Um, and you feel sort of that, I call it the poison. You feel this poison inside of you when something happens, whether your hair's out of place, you have a pimple on your nose or whether your, your team loses or um, your car's acting funny and you're just like, I don't want to pour any more money into this. I mean, whatever it is, right? That's something happening to you. And you're definitely aware of it because you feel it. I mean, you mm-hmm. feel you feel dread or happiness, right? You just get a hundred grand wired into your bank account. You're feeling pretty good. That gave you a lot of meaning, right? That I got to check, check my bank account here. That's right. right. <laughs> Financial security cushion, all that. If you look at it the other way that we give meaning, 
that actually makes us more accountable. Uh, and if we feel powerless, we can then take our power back, but we're accountable. It's on us now. And so what meaning will I give things? Because when the car is making the noise or something's bad's happening, boy, it is, it feels good to be angry. Sometimes it feels good to yell and scream or blame others. So are you aware of the meaning of events in your life? I am for the most part. I usually feel it. And then what that, because I'm not that good at this whole enlightenment thing yet. The, what I really do is I say, am I playing the victim card? Am I letting this event dictate what is valuable, what's important, what the, the definition is here? Or am I going to provide meaning to it? Mm -hmm. Then if I provide meaning to it, then it's up to me. Then it's on me. What do I want to say? So if I don't get the job, if I don't get this, what meaning am I going to be a bliss in any? Like Scott was saying, just positive and say, oh, well, the universe is teaching me something. Or am I going to look deeply? I think for me personally, recently, I've just, I don't, I don't care as much of, of things that I used to care about in the past, what people think of me or whether, whether I'm doing things right. So I'll stop there, but I'm, I think I'm, I mean, there's a lot I'm not aware of, mm -hmm. but I'm definitely aware of more and more things. I think for me, it's, is, is, is the event providing the meaning or am I providing to me or am I providing the meaning to the event? But I, I, I do have to ask Casey, and th yeah. this is only meant somewhat confrontationally, <laughs> which is- Welcome that, back, Casey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, welcome back home. Put up your G. So, <laughs> so what would you say though about the example I gave earlier about the boy sentenced to death? Right, right do we feel that, taking this to the marginal extremes that it's up to him as he's sentenced to death for a sexual assault that never occurred solely basically because of his race, that there's a meaning that it's on him to find on top of dealing with the, his imminent execution. I look to, to answer that. I look at the writings of Nelson Mandela and, mm -hmm. and the peace and calm and not the lack of anger. I mean, definitely not someone being dumb and saying, oh, I guess they're right, or I guess I did something wrong, or in that sense. Um, I don't know what meaning. That is, in this in this matrix, that's the glitch, right? Like, that's when it goes wrong for mm -hmm. us. And in, I provide the wrong meaning. Um, who knows? Maybe that person and was relieved. Maybe he can get out of this life already. Maybe he put meaning on it. And 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 if anyone's listening and disagrees, that's fine. And if you think this sounds horrible, but maybe he said, finally, I'm out. I know the headlines look horrible, but I'm, I'm out. This is what I needed out. I don't know. Maybe he saw meaning that maybe that person who was so simple actually had so much more foresight. And in the same way, Jesus felt like he was here to sacrifice. And for us to be talking about this person so that it doesn't happen down the road. Maybe he was so out of his body that the pain and the suffering we see, he didn't feel. Maybe just like Jesus on the cross, he he didn't even feel it anymore. He was so in spirit. I don't know. I hope that's the meaning he mm -hmm. he found in it. Mm -hmm. If he found meaning that he was wrong, that's that is just such a painful episode for him. I I, I can't even imagine it. Mm -hmm. Um but I, I find solace in, in what Mandela and just the calm and the peace or the Dalai Lama and all the suffering they have. I mean, can you believe the Dalai Lama is like one of the funniest, most humorous guys on this planet and considering all the pain that he has had to endure for such a long life. So I don't know. I hope, I hope that person in your story had a just was more connected with spirit than body realized that, you know, row, row, row your boat. Life is but a dream. And that hoped that his story would be an example like it is that we're talking about it now and that that would never happen again. Um, that's all the meaning I can give it. You mm -hmm. just told the story, which I had never heard before, mm -hmm. which just came to me through vibrations of this thing called the Internet. Yeah. It resonated on my eardrums. It then, through some other vibration, was processed in my brain and now I have a new learning. So now what is, what is Casey, what meaning is Casey Berman going to give it? Mm -hmm. 
I mean, I could give it a meaning that the world is horrible and I could go and yell and scream at my kids and just be horrible. I could go, who knows what I could do. Um, at the same time, I'm going to, I'm going to admire that young man and I hope he is, his spirit is at rest and I hope he's actually so much more insightful and enlightened than we are to realize that it's all okay and that the event that happened actually has a, has, I won't even say positive, has a beneficial purpose because we're talking about him right now. Yeah. And that does go as to what I mentioned briefly, the potential cosmic way of looking at meaning versus purely the personal. Yeah. I think it also goes to the point, uh, Jessica pointed out this in the comments, and that is, are we willing to believe that unfairness and death and anger and sadness and grief and unjust situations could be for good? So this is something that I've actually had a question about for quite some time, considering the events that I think we've experienced as a country, as a world in the year of 2020, uh, when it comes to just well, many different things, COVID, race, and you, you kind of, you name it. Mm -hmm. But I've been very curious as far as some of the things that have happened is I'm trying to understand was the the overarching meaning for them to happen so that we could see the possibility for change. We could see the possibilities mm -hmm. for growth. And it's, I, I don't think there's necessarily a, a right or wrong answer, or I don't think there is the ultimate answer to that question. But I think it boils down to, something that the two of you have touched upon as well as Jessica and anyone else that's listening. And that's the choice, <laughs> the choice that I'm willing to make as it comes to the events and the meaning that I'm willing to give to each and every single one of them, which could also change depending on how I'm feeling or where I'm at or the chapter that I'm currently in within my life. You know, I remember when I, however many years ago, when I didn't have the same perspective or open mind someone would tell me an event and I would look at it as my way or the highway. Now I'm a lot more open as far as, well, it could be that. It is possible to wash a dish 50 different ways. It doesn't have to be done only one way. So I also find that to be fascinating how depending on where I am in life, the meaning of the events can shift as well and, and can take a different form. And the reason, part of the reason I think that's so and that everything is relative, which a lot of people may not want to hear because it's difficult to think that everything is relative, but a lot of what we see in the present moment is based on our past mm -hmm. and, and what we bring to it. And so um, it's stages in life and it's also each of us has a, has a different past, which is why when you meet someone who has similar issues that you've run into or just similar experiences, whether it's the same race or religion, or you both went to the same summer camp, or you both had abusive parents or whatever it is, there's that connection because you're viewing world the world in the same way mm -hmm. because our past experiences are mostly unfortunately, because um, it doesn't let us be in the moment, our past experiences really help drive that meaning that we see in the now. Not necessarily looking for uh, the exact event of when this happened for you, Casey, but do you remember what shifted in your life that helps you see world as a place that is relative depending on the perspective and the opinion of whoever instead of, hey, it can only be this way and it can't be any other way? Yeah, there there are a few, um, and I won't bore with, with my life. I'll go quickly, but I mean, <laughs> <laughs> there was one. So there was one when I was camping with my buddies and we were in the middle of the wilderness and, uh, and we were having a, let's just say we we're having a ton of fun and we're middle of nowhere. And I was uh, 20 and I had just, I broke away on my own. And I remember just kind of laying up looking at the, the Trinity Alps here in California. And I had this, this moment of just realizing, and this meaning came, this message came to me that, um, even if I had lost everything in life, family and friends and everything, um, I would still be okay. And I'll never forget that. Mm. Um, I sort of buried that message and sort of, what was that? Okay. Uh, I then moved forward to, um, my wife and I, when we first got married, uh, when we first moved in together, she showed me, uh, what's the bleep that movie, what's the bleep mm -hmm. and, uh, about quantum physics. Um, before that, there was someone who kind of mentioned to me how my life was like an outline and I was following a path. I'll never forget when she said that. Mm -hmm. And then my daughter was born. She was about seven months. She was in the high chair. 
and I'll never forget reading the New York Times, which I would get as the newspaper, the actual the actual paper version, and it said all the news that's fit to print. And I remember it had coups and and just horrible, horrible news on the front page. And I looking at my daughter and I said, this isn't all the news and I canceled my subscription. And there's a few other moments <laughs> since then, but those are some that jumped to mind to me where it was, they were, they were red pill moments. They were just, um, you hear something, you can't unring a bell. You just, you just like law school, you going to law school, this is where I'm supposed to be in law school, just not being what mm -hmm. I want. And so the plan that I had, sort of breaking apart. And so there were moments like that in my life that wasn't just one, but they sort of built on each other. And then uh, they kind of accelerated and come closer together in my in my mid thirties and and now in, in my forties. And so there were things like that and you you need to listen to them. But once you listen to them, you know, you can't unring a bell. Mm -hmm. And even though it's more difficult, it's easy to just like Cypher did and just just eat the steak, even though you know it's an illusion. It's easy to just jump into that illusion and hear no evil, see no evil, even if you have anxiety, but just here's my life. But once you kind of hear that voice that there's something else out there, it becomes that that lifelong adventure. How do you personally choose which of the events have meaning? So you, you mentioned all of those and clearly they have meaning in your life. Well, I'm projecting that, but I'm assuming they have meaning in your life because you can still recall them. And it sounds like with some of them, you can even recall them to the nearest detail, like where it happened, how it happened, who was there and everything. How do you personally choose that in your life that this is an event that's going to have meaning for X number of whatever years. And then this is something that only has meaning now and doesn't necessarily have to have anything beyond this current moment. Yeah. I don't think I don't, I don't choose them. My, my unconscious, my subconscious, whatever word you want to use the, the part mm -hmm. of my brain that isn't conscious, the part uh, chooses them for me. And I think that's based on my conscious beliefs. So consciously, I believe things. Um, I, I should just be an employee. I should be an entrepreneur. The United mm -hmm. States is the best. The United States is not the best. Um, you think of all the things we believe, right? And uh, I should work it hard and grind it out and work every day or just let it come to me. Just go with the flow. Think of all the things you believe. And then kind of based on those conscious beliefs, your unconscious will surface up what's happened to you in the past. These these memories, these these ideas, these these other beliefs and verify for it. And so I think for me, consciously, when you hear that voice consciously, mm -hmm. what that is the ability for you to go back to your subconscious and and change things it's through therapy you go back and you you face a fear you face something that subconsciously you have been thinking about for a very long time mm -hmm. and you either embrace it and understand it or you see that it's a fear and and then you let it go and when you let a fear that might have been holding you back go or just let it be and let it sort of filter out um certain things change in your conscious but your conscious life and what you have physically in your life and what you have emotionally in life is really an output of what your subconscious and your unconscious mm -hmm. is is dealing with. Um, mm -hmm. Unfortunately, most of us don't delve there. We don't learn this in school. Um, and that's why the quote the person said that most of your second half in life is unlearning. Most most are all of what you learned and did in your first half. Um, but that's that's for me. If you talk about meaning. I think the meaning of life for me has just been appreciating life mm -hmm. um, and stop finding a meaning and just appreciating, you know, being here. Um, so, Mr. Mason, how do you make that choice in your life? Being aware first and foremost mm -hmm. of the yeah. fact that I have interpretive powers over my life and that my life is a narrative that I have the power to wield via my own pen. You and I, in some other conversations, and those that know me well know that and this has come up more recently with a coach I'm working in, so there's some, with mm -hmm. some background here, that I have a fixation on mythology. Mythology, for the most part, are creating, it exists to create a cultural narrative. Most of the great hero myths were really foundational stories of city-states. 
and they were told in a way that captivates us and have deeper meanings that we have chosen and can interpret. But at the end of the day, they justified, at least in their initial inceptions, the founding of empires. Why do I raise that? Because that is a power that we each have if we choose to view our lives as an empire of our own building. Mm. So when we create our own myths, we're creating the foundations for that. However, I want to step back and also say that I've been contemplating through some professional work that I've been doing uh, an additional thought about meaning. I do believe, as Casey suggested, and as I expounded on just a minute ago, that there is meaning that can be found in our own life and we have that power. Mm -hmm. But I cannot help but wonder sometimes too, if there are additional meanings that are coming from something greater and beyond. And this has come up recent, recently for me in a way that's personal, but I've been examining really what's going on here and saying, is there a message from somewhere else that I'm supposed to be hearing? As you all know, I recently started earlier, well, at the beginning of the summer, mm -hmm. I started a new season of my podcast. And in fact, Casey was a recent guest on it. And Oleg, in fact, the only reason you're not a guest on it is because you're going to be doing other things that are too good to make you a viable guest on my little show. Yeah, I was going to so say, I feel kind of love A temper out. tantrum about that right then and now. <laughs> but, but that being said, really, it's uh, the show has a very, very specific focus. And I don't want to self-promote, but I'm going to tell you this for a reason. reason. The focus of the show is on spirituality, ethics, and connection to purpose in the face of the decline in religiosity in around the world. Mm -hmm. The reason why I mentioned the focus is because a theme that has been coming up over and over and over again, repeatedly, and this just came up in an episode that I taped yesterday, has been climate change. No matter who I talk to, Casey, you've actually been maybe the rare exception. This theme keeps being raised by guests. One of them was talking about reincarnation climate change comes up. Another was talking about consciousness, climate change comes up. Another was talking about uh, social ethics, climate change, change comes up. Another one was talking about inner transformation and, and alternate spiritualities, climate change comes up. And as I was processing the lessons that I'm learning or the issues that are being raised by the guests, and I don't, I'm not particularly interested, or so I thought, I understand climate change is a serious issue and I don't want to contribute to it. And I do all of the things that a regular citizen like myself can do to, mm -hmm. to contribute to its minimization, but it's not my cause. Yet here it is. And as I was writing down the lessons from this podcast that has nothing to do on the surface with climate change, with a diversity of guests who have nothing in common that would lead me to think that they all would feel like they need to talk about climate change, I began to wonder, I began to feel like as I was processing this, that my podcast and the conscious world that I was operating in were the same as me sitting in this little box in the corner of my 500 square foot apartment now. But right behind this curtain here, something is pounding. Something is pounding, waiting to be let in my consciousness. And that felt like climate change. Part of what I'm looking to process internally with my coach through journaling, what this is about. Mm -hmm. What, why is in a, what is the meaning of repeatedly in an ethics, purpose, and spirituality related podcast that I specifically try and avoid politics on is climate change coming up every time I turn around. Mm -hmm. And that's the sort of thing that does make me suspect that there may also be more to the discovery of meaning than what is within our internal consciousnesses. Mm -hmm. uh, the book, The Surrender Experiment, which you read recently, and I don't know if you've ever read it, Casey, I don't know to what extent anyone watching or listening to this has ever read it, but for God's sake, by Michael Singer, read it. Book, also, yeah. hints at that sort of thing going on through some events that occurred in that author's life. And by the way, that author is highly credible. I think he was the first president of WebMD. I mean, he's not just some yes. right nobody that just popped out of nowhere, <laughs> nothing to credentialize what he has to say. Well, I, I think it also kind of going back to that book and, and what I can recall from it, that the hard part, the difficult part that I found in understanding, and that's, I think it relates to just 
opportunities that certain or maybe all events have for me in life. And that's similar conversations I've had, whether it's podcasts or strangers or whatever the occasion might be. And I would hear some of these repeated events and I get curious as far as, okay, is this a sign from life? Is this a sign from life that I'm being presented with that this is an area that I should explore or mm -hmm. dig deeper? And that's the hardest part. And I don't know how the two of you interpret this, but that's the most difficult part <laughs> that I find within this journey is that it's very it's very difficult to know. There is, um, I was having a conversation recently with an uh, individual. His name is uh, J.R. Martinez, and he mentioned this concept that, at least in America, according to him, many people look for billboards. And, and what he meant by that is billboards that can give you the exact direction of where you should go and what you should do as you embark on that particular journey. And I find that interesting because when I think about the events that have happened in my life and the events that I choose to pursue, I find that sometimes there is not necessarily a clear cut path. In your case, as you were mentioning, Scott, climate change came up. It, it could come up. It came up again, this conversation. <laughs> so is that is that something that you choose to act upon, create meaning from? That's the harder part, I think, for me to understand is, is is this a sign from whatever the source that I believe, or is this just another random encounter? Because there's also an element of randomness in this world, at least in my opinion. Randomness, I agree. I think that there, if there's anything I learned from the surrender experiment, though, is to not discount or dismiss things as random that are so unlikely to be random. And, and the climate change is just one example of that. Again, there are a zillion different business podcasts out there. There are a zillion different podcasts about horror. There are a zillion different podcasts about a zillion different themes. Mm -hmm. And and there are podcasts about climate change and the environment. And none of these people are choosing to be there. I and mean, they are, perhaps. But, but it, it is one of those things where I do feel like we can find meaning from random events if we choose due to our brain's evolution mm -hmm. uh, have a tendency to see patterns but that being said the ability to see patterns was one of the reasons our species has been successful mm -hmm. we noticed for instance that every six months in our area of the wilderness where we were that there are droughts so we try and control the water because mm -hmm. we're capable of observing patterns and so and, and those th those periods of drought were not just random they may have been created by random forces, but they're not just random. And in the case of this climate change, for instance, I'm choosing, I could say, oh, this is all just a random coincidence and ignore it. Mm -hmm. Lived experience, which I've also come to accept as a something to just pay attention to, as well as intuition sometimes, uh, has taught me, eh, don't, I, I ignore things that are constantly being shoved in my face at my own peril. Mm-hmm. This might be a bold statement here, but do you, either of you think that one of the reasons why some or many, whatever the number looks like, trying to create meaning from events in their lives in order to control our existence? Is that the reason why we do it? So there's something called the spiritual ego. I think the answer is yes. And there's something called the spiritual ego, which so the ego and you hear it in Zen, you hear it from Freud, you hear it from, from Lot. But, but a good definition that I've heard from the ego is the ego is that, that self, that entity, that story that we've created um, as a way for us to put out to the world. Mm -hmm. That's a story that we want. That's our, that's our ego. And our ego, this story doesn't really like change that much because it wants to keep that story going. If we change, if we start listening to these things, we then stop that story. And that story dies, and that story doesn't like it. Now, what is an example of an ego? It could be you're you're organized, you're climbing the corporate ladder, you're upstanding individual. It could also be you're a creative genius, you're always disorganized. It could be any story that you want. It could be anxiety. It could be I'm just the the world is a wreck. 
there's there you know you know uh, uh grumpy smurf right i mean grumpy mm -hmm. smurf your ego was i'm just gonna be unhappy all the time okay like if that's what you want right um so whatever your ego is is really just the story you're putting out there now sometimes the ego will hijack the self-development and will hijack everything scott's talking about mm -hmm. and you'll make there's a book 10 percent happier by this ABC correspondent who talks about meditation and how it can make you happier. And that's kind of where it's going and where doing these type of things has a purpose. It's going to, you know, help one of my players on the giants was talking about him, how he meditates and visualizes the military's using it. I think that's all great. At the same time, meditation is not necessarily a means to end. It's not a hack mm -hmm. and being spiritual and self-development is not a hack. Mm -hmm. not to get a little bit more out of the day it can lead to that but the main point that i see and and so the spiritual ego is doing that well let me just find a let's find some meaning in something so wow climate change has come up a lot or wow a leaf just fell in front of my face and it twirled or there's a billboard there or you know my wife brought up this for the third time you know i'm gonna find meaning in it did I just have a little bit of a slap down there? <laughs> Whoa. But are you going to find it? I mean, I would say, Scott, to your thing, yeah, maybe, or maybe not. It's up to you yeah. if you want. And so for me, I, so, so that's the thing I need to be aware of with meaning is that who, where is this meaning coming from? So to the point of, are there certain things coming in life? I, am very wary now and I don't look to the event for meaning kind of similar to what we we're talking about in the beginning. I go to my feeling. Is it something? So something came up with my kids just last night and I was thinking about the two of them and just their personalities and it just popped to me. And I said, huh, I never realized that. And it more of was myself surfacing. So for me, I think the most important events that come up are those that we ourselves surface up. So with the climate change, I'm not, I'm not being confrontational here. What I'm saying is I think something surfaced inside of you, Scott, around mm -hmm. hearing that a lot. And then the question is, well, what meaning do you give it? Um, maybe it's that climate change isn't something separate. Maybe it's that the world, the reason all of this is happening is just like when you get a cold and you push yourself too much, the world is just tired. Yeah. World and this egoic narrative that we have grow, 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 Wall Street earnings every three months, go conquer the world, bulldozers, rockets, guns. I mean, all of this egoic narrative. And what you said, Scott, at a cosmic level, at an exponential level, this story wants to stay alive in the world because people are making a lot of profit on it. Mm -hmm. But I think the world, the, the gut and the soul of the world is literally saying, is, is, is giving us the opportunity to take the red pill when it comes to the world itself. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Billy Atwell shared in a uh, great remark here in the comments, and that is he can't help but think. Yeah. William Blake and Shakespeare, while listening to this conversation and their concepts, all things are neutral, but it is choice of thinking makes it so whether good or bad. That's right. And I find that to be interesting. I think similar to both of your points, as well as anyone else that's shared, and that's, I, in my opinion, and, and based on what I've heard today, it sounds like much of it truly does boil down to a choice. <laughs> what is the choice that you're willing and wanting to make? And, and then from there, what's the meaning that... So it's almost as if meaning is a byproduct of the choice that is made. And the bigger choice is, am I going to be a victim of the events or am I going to dictate what those events mean to me? Mm -hmm. And not a control dictate, I'm God and I'm coming down, I'm on a monarch, I'm going to control. It's not that level of control, but it's, it's what meaning am I going to give to it? Because it's really easy to say that the event the generator of the meaning is doing it to me then it's out of our hands mm -hmm. no woe is me it's out of our hands mm -hmm. what billy's talking about with everything being neutral is that it's incumbent upon us to provide it meaning which then begs mm -hmm. the question okay 
Casey, what meaning are you going to give this? Mm -hmm. I, you know, the pushback that I have on that, though, is that really has the potential, if taken to a certain place, to endorse moral relativism. And that is a place that I'm uncomfortable with. So I will respectfully disagree with that, mm -hmm. where that moves, I think in some cases, perhaps when it comes to events that are out of control happening to us, the meaning of the events in our lives are something that are, are things that um, are defined by our actions. But the actions that we take upon others, in my opinion, are a different story. I find it very hard, for instance, to accept that a genocide is itself just neutral. It's only bad because we decide that it's bad. No, it's bad. So think about, and part of the reason I push on extremes here is because the extremes really define the limits of an argument that we're making. And if the argument cannot be taken to the extremes, then perhaps there's an internal flaw in that argument that's worth examining. Or it may be simply that that argument is only good up to a certain horizon. And then understanding when that horizon is crossed is helpful for us to understand it. I'm very cautious personally, and again, with all due respect to everything that's being said here, because it has opened my mind and it's given me a lot of pause about things that I've thought and felt mm -hmm. secure in my thinking around. And, and, and the minds that are on display during this conversation today have been you know, blowing to me. Uh, but uh, the implications though are also worth considering. So it's that relativism that that is so uncomfortable and why people won't take the accountability. Now, being Jewish and talking about the latest, or one of the latest, I guess Rwanda was the latest, but you know, with the Holocaust, yeah, it's horrible. I mean, mm -hmm. like, I mean, horrible doesn't even, even go there. Yeah. But let's take the genocide that has been led by humans and wheat. Wheat is the most populous grain on the face of this earth mm -hmm. and has killed off over pretty much every continent except Antarctica and I think Australia, millions of native plants. Yeah, Chickens and cows are the most popular living beings besides insects on this earth. We celebrate that as the agricultural revolution, which by the way, was the biggest fraud on humans ever. But we celebrate that and we celebrate that as a way to fill in the blank, right? snub our nose at the gods, haha, <laughs> drought won't ever get us, we won't run out of food. That is a genocide. It's disgusting. You want to talk about climate change. Climate change means, if the climate change means a lot to us, the fact that we have killed off and eroded so much beautiful land for our need to manufacture food and not rely on nature to provide it to us is a genocide. Mm -hmm. So which genocide are you going to choose? Now, if you want to choose the Jews, it's horrible. The Rwandans in 94, horrible. The Armenians by the Turks. And if, there, if some people may not call that a genocide, the Armenians in, in the early 1900s. I mean, there's so many other genocides that have gone on that we deem bad. But I will say, if you're going to do that, the genocide of wheat, the genocide of chickens. Let's, I mean, all yeah, look, I think that it's worth taking my arguments to the extreme too. I yeah. think to me, there's an easy cutoff point there. We, it's not a sentient being. Animals, it's a different story. And and there are moral consequences and, and there is an argument to be made or maybe not to be made. I personally don't accept the argument that animals are the same as humans in terms of the implications of their, of their, um, of, extinctions and that sort of thing but 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 i say that knowing that there are extraordinarily compelling arguments that, that are contrary to mine and they're made in many cases by minds that are a lot brighter than mine so yeah. no, no, i'm really happy I'm gonna, to concede the possibilities there i'm gonna play the game i'm gonna play the game at a dinner party i am not going to equate the the genocide of chickens to the genocide of the holocaust right like everyone's gonna look at me crazy and i won't get served my next dish i get it we live in this world i'll play the game but the if we want to see to the point of, of billy talking about neutral i do think that rule holds true mm -hmm. 
what the compromise that we make or just the play is that we've got a foot in the spiritual and you have a foot in the physical. You have a foot in form, right? In the bodies in the tangible and you have a foot out of it. And you realize everything is neutral in this body, in this world, humans being killed in a manufactured factory like way is bad. Wheat spreading across the world so we humans can eat is good or at least not bad. Okay. That's a determination we have made that is pretty much an absolute in well, this world. Well, that's because there's been no compelling argument made that wheat is somehow superior or inferior to those native plants that it's replaced. Whereas in the case of human genocides, there's a general, there's a by and large ethical consensus that as a species, none of us are better or worse than the other. Mm -hmm. If we were run, if this world was run, if the ones that could really think were the native plants, we'd have a different story, right? We would have a different story. Different meaning. So I hear you. I'm playing the game. We no, good. that's fine. I like playing it. Yeah, <laughs> I get it. The point I think Billy was making, and this is where I go, was that when it comes to nature, that relativism that can cause uncomfort for many people, for me, it's very uncomfortable. But that's the uh, that's the deal you make when you take the red pill. That's the insight that you get. But along with it comes that uncomfortability that one. Everything is kind of relative based on our meaning. And two, people are going to look at you crazy if you if you say this out loud. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I also think just uh, briefly touch upon the point that Billy and Jessica and, and the two of you have brought up. It's So I, I'm on the side where I do agree that every event is neutral. Now, I, I think there is a – this is my opinion of it. I think it starts off as neutral, and then from there I can choose whether or not X, Y, and Z is good or bad, but it, I think it, I, I just don't, I don't see how it could start as something other than not neutral experience, because that's where I think the choice is made as far as, okay, this is good. This is bad. This is something I follow. This is, I don't. So that I'm not, not arguing with you, Scott, or I'm not trying to, uh, <laughs> I don't care if I'm the only one that thinks what I think. I'm cool with that. That's been the it's, story of my life. I'm, I'm just, <laughs> and I don't personalize anything. I'm just trying to understand it more so on, on my own terms. And, and I think as it applies to the topics and the themes that we've explored throughout this particular series, when it comes to traumatic experiences, for example, childhood adversity, something that some or many of us might have experienced. But I think what, what I was trying, what I think this conversation helped me realize is that yes, those events took place and yes, they happened the way that they did, but there is a different series of choices that could possibly be made in order well, to but that doesn't shift necessarily, the meaning. Yeah, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the underlying events were neutral. Correct. Well, well wait, 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 wait. B back up. Why? Why? Because yeah. what, it's entirely possible that events that were not morally neutral or that were not neutral in what other ethical framework you might be looking at them mm -hmm. can still have occurred and we can still accept them and we can still believe that we have choice as to how to deal with them without necessarily conceding that the events themselves were neutral. Okay. Right. I look at it as they're neutral and then I give it meaning. And usually mm -hmm. if we live in a society, enough people will give the same amount of meaning. And then we all agree and say, that's right. Mm -hmm. And then when someone comes around later on and says, no, actually there's some data that shows that it's different. So the world is flat. I mean, enough people gave that geological, that, that cosmological attribute, that meaning. And then Copernicus and Galileo came around and said, actually, it's mm -hmm. not. And, you know, they were, we, we know the persecution they came under because it went against that narrative, that egoic story that humans were the center of the universe. God forbid anything else be the center of it. Um, and then it came around and the facts were enough to show that actually they were right. The enlightenment happened along with it. And you had this combination of people saying, we're going to change our mind on this. Um, mm -hmm. so that's something where it was neutral until we, we gave it meaning. Now, who knows? I'll tell you the data, like I, 
maybe the world isn't flat. I mean, actually, the world is not round. It's mm -hmm. sort of oval-like where the mm -hmm. Earth stretches mm -hmm. in certain ways. It's not a round sphere. Now, if I went out in the world and now and said, you know, actually, the Earth is not around like a round ball i think people would look at me kind of well what is it well it's kind of oblong and it changes and it you're telling me the world is the world is motion and it moves well yeah i mean that might be something that right now is proven by science but a lot of people on the street wouldn't believe me like yeah. you're kind of crazy to say the world is oblong and not right. well, understand the differentiator that i that i threw out there right up front i wasn't talking about situations where things <laughs> where things um, happen. I wasn't talking about the assessment of natural situations. I was talking about active things that happen to us. The world being round or oblong or whatever isn't the result of a human being or uh, acting on us. That's just a fact of nature. But saying that all events are neutral, that includes the events that are involving people acting upon the world. And that's a totally different situation, at least to me. Mm -hmm. Well, if you, I mean, let's look at Trump. Let's take it. I mean, if you look at Trump, a politician acting on the world, I mean, look at what Texas and what certain areas have done in, in banning abortion. If you're on the left or even in the middle, I mean, these are, these are spark worthy issues for you. And you're the meaning you give them is the world's going to hell in a handbasket and and i can't believe this and i wish ruth bader ginsburg had retired earlier and damn mitch mcconnell and all of that right if you're on the right you're saying whoo finally some semblance of organization in the world finally we're protecting the unborn these crazy liberals from san francisco uh, are losing a bit of the grip on this and you know, the world's not going crazy. There is some, some structure in the world again. Mm -hmm. God bless Trump. God bless the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Right? So you've got two different meanings. It's very neutral on a very hot topic. And so how do you look now? How did me, where I'm trying to stay out of politics and I don't really want to get worked up about something like that. I look at it like this is the ego is just loving it. These narratives, you know how alive both of these narratives are? Do you know how alive the left is on this? Do you know how alive, you know how much money both sides are going to raise on this? You on know, this Justin, episode alone, yeah. Yeah, Justin Breyer. <laughs> Justin Breyer is going to be in the news for years now. I mean, this is... I. If you're a liberal listening, come, feel free to try and smack me. This is one of the best things for liberal groups. Planned Parenthood is going to rake in so much money off of this, as they should. Use it. That's great. But that's how I'm looking at it. I'm just looking at this as dueling narratives that are coming together. This is the battle of the titans. And the left loves, the left needs. Both of them, the left and the right, both extremes need a bad guy. The Giants need the Dodgers. The Israelis need the Palestinians. The Catholics need the Protestants and vice versa in Northern Ireland. They need this. The far woke left needs the rabid January 6th right. They need each other. This is their narrative. If anything, what's going on right now is so good for the extremes. As they say, when two elephants fight, it's the grass that suffers. And what mm -hmm. really suffers here is, is us in the middle, mm -hmm. is us the moderates, the ones who, who the Republicans and the Democrats who get along every day, who love each other. That's who really suffers here. And so for in any meaning I take from this is I got to find good meaning. I got to see what's going on and understand who's been, follow the money, understand who's benefiting from this. But at the same time, understand that life is great for me, for my family, for those around me, and not let these extreme narratives sort of take me off my axis. Mm. As we get to the top of the hour, what is the meaning that the two of you choose to take away from the following comment here? <laughs> and by this, I mean, as in this conversation, I think Jessica means. I think that's what she meant too. And she, <laughs> and she had to step outside. <laughs> Uh, no, I love it. I mean, this is why, this is why I come on here. I think it's, I think it's a fantastic way to express, uh, 
what we're what how we're feeling and what we're doing i could be totally wrong um but as far as fiery i think fiery is is making us think is mm -hmm. i mean we're uncomfortable then if this conversation is uncomfortable uh unpack why why is it uncomfortable mm -hmm. now scott and i love each other so there's nothing there we're, you know i mean we're we're confronting and and having fun so i don't know if it's anything there i think it's just more of um we differ on worldviews and and how we're going to find meaning um so i think we probably both can appreciate jessica's sense of humor she's pulling out we are the world from the 1980s <laughs> <laughs> Lionel Richie was heavily involved in that. Lionel Richie, my nemesis. We can see humor in that. <laughs> another That's event great. with another another, another event. Another event. Lionel Richie. What are some ways that, and I'll start with you, Scott, that people can find more about what you're doing and, and the meaning that you choose to create in this world? Scott Mason Central, which you've got to know to love, <laughs> is PurposeHighway.com. If you feel like the, today's episode was fire and you're interested in learning more, or if you want to hear all of these people talk about climate change when I have not asked them about it, <laughs> go to my podcast, PurposeHighway.com. And uh, you can also find out how to book me for speaking engagements. You can find links to my social media. Everything is on PurposeHighway.com, and I'd love to see you there. Mr. Berman. Yeah, I help unhappy attorneys to leave the law. So you can find me at leavelawbehind.com. I appreciate the two of you for uh, this conversation. It definitely opened my eyes to many things that I may or may not have seen before. But I, I will say that there is <clears throat> what I'm choosing to take away from it is especially when it comes to some of these more, I guess you could say, hot or fiery topics, as Jessica, um, to quote her, I, I think there is tremendous meaning that I choose to take away from it. And that's what is that discomfort? Why do I feel discomfortable or uncomfortable? Why I'm making up words here, but uh, where is it coming from? And I, and I think there's, there's power in that. In my opinion, there's power in being able to ask that question and there's power in being able to have a space like this where we can have a conversation that varies in perspectives and views and opinions. And we may or may not, always agree and we may leave this conversation not agreeing on certain things but at the same time it, it raises the in my opinion it raises the necessary questions oh like if i could say one final thing briefly of course thank you i recently was on a show with rabbi Jonathan goldson and a psychiatrist that he mm -hmm. works with um and they it was an, it's an ethics podcast and they were guests and the discussion that we had was Jonathan Goldson is an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, and he's extremely Torah-based in his ethical approach. And the discussion was around homosexuality. I am LGBTQ. Mm -hmm. And our feelings about that as an ethical matter are radically different. And we had a discussion that was civil yet fiery, and we knew walking into it that we would have it. But one of the things that I felt strongly about that was that if we can't, and it goes as a comment Jessica had about disagreeing but still being friends. Mm -hmm. If we cannot tolerate differences within our own community, if we can't manage our feeling states, if we can't have control and the ability to build facing small challenges like disagreements as to opinion, how on earth are we as a nation of leaders or people who want to be leaders going to be able to face the big challenges in the world? Yeah. Yeah. And that's where I think this space really serves a purpose. And, and that's why I appreciate the two of you or anyone else that we ever have as guests or uh, panelists on this particular series and, and Jessica and everyone that's in the comments. I mean, it's, it goes exactly <laughs> to your point, Scott. I think it, it, it'd be very difficult to move and transition beyond some of these obstacles unless we're able to have a, uh, an open dialogue around our views and, and what we ultimately believe. So I just want to thank the two of you. I want to thank Jessica. I want to thank Billy. I want to thank everyone else that tuned in or is continuing to tuning in right now. And we look forward to seeing you next Friday.